Here is a little mathematical challenge. Take two identical plates and draw a line from each point on the bottom plate to a point on the top plate. Now, can you find a way to continuously draw these lines such that no line is exactly vertical? Another way to rephrase this challenge is can you find a continuous function from a disk to itself which has no fixed points? After trying to do this for a couple hours, you might realize that this challenge is impossible to fulfill. The reason behind it has a wonderful proof, which uses some of the core ideas of modern math. Today, I want to show you this proof, not just for the case of two plates, but also for the case of spheres and hyperspheres. This video is aimed for a general audience, so I can't promise that we'll cover everything completely rigorously. Our aim will be just to get the main intuitive feel for how the proof works. But for those that are interested, there are lots of wonderful sources linked in the description that fill in all the details. Okay, with that said, let's start with our proof. We need a tool from Algebra to do our proof a tool which is called the fundamental group. Essentially, the fundamental group is a way of assigning an algebraic structure to every topological space. The way that we do this is by observing the behavior of loops on a topological space. For example, if you look at the field circle, every loop on the field circle can be deformed into any other loop continuously. Because of this fact, we can think of the loops on the field circle as carrying no algebraic structure. So in this case, we write that the fundamental group of the field circle, which we denote with this pi 1 symbol, is zero. In contrast, let's look at the fundamental group of a proper circle. In this case, if you look at these two loops, you can see that there is no way to deform the red loop into the blue loop. This happens precisely because there is a hole in the circle. Therefore, there is a richer algebraic structure to loops compared to the field circle. In particular, all the possible classes of loops that can't be deformed into each other can be labeled by an integer, which corresponds to how many times the loop wraps around the circle and in which direction. So we say that the fundamental group of the circle is the integers, which we denote as z. The main point here is not necessarily to understand how and why the fundamental group is formed, but rather that there is a way to assign an algebraic structure to every topological space. Now, the power of the fundamental group is that it allows us to give a relatively simple proof as to why there is always a fixed point in any continuous mapping between field circles. We do this by contradiction. Suppose there is a continuous map, F, from a field circle onto itself, which has no fixed points. Now, for a point X, let's draw a ray from the new point, F of X, back to x, and see where it intersects the boundary of the circle. Precisely because we assume there are no fixed points, this ray always exists for every point. Let's call the point that we get on the boundary from this procedure R of x. Notice that when we do this procedure on the boundary of the circle, R of x just returns to the point x. So the function r is really a continuous function from the field circle onto the proper circle. Now, here's where things get nice. We first consider an inclusion map from the proper circle onto the field circle. This means that we take a point from the proper circle to exactly where it should be on the field circle. Now, for the second step, we take a point from the field circle to R of x, which is back on the proper circle. By composing the two maps, we get a map from the proper circle to itself. But there's something special about this map. All the points on the circle are just mapped exactly to themselves. So this map is really just the identity from the circle to itself. 
We draw this diagram right here to represent the situation. Now, let's look at the fundamental group of Fitch space, which we'll just fill in from our discussion earlier, replacing the topological spaces by their fundamental groups the diagram transforms into this right here. But notice that the functions from our previous diagram translate nicely into functions between the fundamental groups. Let's try to intuitively understand why the functions between topological spaces translate into functions between the fundamental groups. First, remember that the fundamental group gets its algebraic structure from the behavior of loops on a topological space. Now, think about a loop on a topological space. When we apply a continuous function to the whole topological space, this loop is mapped to a new loop on the new topological space. In this way, we can think of continuous functions as mapping loops to loops which loosely give us a map from one fundamental group to another. The main important result here is that our maps, I and R, give us these new maps between the fundamental groups. But do you notice now that there is something strange in the diagram that we've just created? What this diagram says is that the identity function between the integers is the same as a function from the integers to zero, composed with a function from zero to the integers. But this, very obviously, can't be true, because then the function from zero to the integers would need to have several different outputs from one input. But this is no longer a function. In other words, we've reached a contradiction and finished our proof. Let's recap what we just did. We started by assuming that there was a function f from the field circle to the field circle which had no fixed points. This function f then allowed us to create a new function r which gave us this diagram. When we translated this diagram into algebraic terms using the fundamental group, we saw that something was very obviously wrong there could not be a function from the integers to zero back to the integers, which was equal to the identity on the integers. In other words, we reached a contradiction on our original assumption of the function f having no fixed points. This means that every continuous function between the field circle and itself must have at least one fixed point. If this is all a bit confusing, please don't be alarmed. What you're learning now is typically an idea that is shown at the end of a math undergraduate curriculum or even at the start of a graduate program in math. So it's natural that it all takes a while to process. But even if you don't fully understand what we just did, I think there's still a way to appreciate the beauty of the problem-solving strategy that we just used. What we essentially did was take a topological problem, then translate it into an algebraic language. In this algebraic language, it became very apparent that a certain property of having no fixed points could not be true. So we took what looked to be a very difficult problem and made it incredibly easy by translating it to algebraic terms. This kind of approach in math has been central to solving some of the most difficult problems in the past century and it's truly a beautiful thing to see. What we just proved is called Brouwer's Fixed Point Theorem in two dimensions, which says that a continuous map between a field circle to itself must always have a fixed point. Now, I want to talk briefly about how one can generalize this from two dimensions to three, four, and arbitrarily large dimensions. So for the case of three dimensions, our statement would say that any map from a field sphere to itself must contain a fixed point. The way that you would prove this is very similar to our original strategy, but instead of using the fundamental group, we will use another algebraic object known as the singular homology. It would be a big digression on this video to explain the singular homology, so I'll skip out on this for this video. But actually, 
We don't really need to even know how the singular homology is constructed to understand this proof. All that is really important for us to know is that the singular homology assigns an algebraic object to a topological space, just like with the fundamental group. So we proceed like before by assuming that there is a map which has no fixed points, and then trying to find a contradiction. We again create a function r, which draws the ray from f of x to x and returns to the point of intersection on the boundary. Composing this with the inclusion like before, we get a very similar diagram, like last time. And again, just like before, we'll translate this diagram back to algebraic language to make it simpler. In this case, all the information that we need to prove the theorem is that the singular homology of the field sphere is zero, and the singular homology of the proper sphere is not zero. So our translated diagram looks something like this. Here, k is an algebraic object which is not zero. But again, what the diagram here is saying is that the identity function of k is the same as a function which goes from k to zero, and then from zero back to k. But because k is not zero itself, this is evidently false and is a contradiction. This means that every continuous map between field spheres must have a fixed point. Again, let's recap what we just did. We essentially took our original topological problem and translated it to algebraic terms with the singular homology. Now, when looking at the problem through algebraic terms, it became very clear that a contradiction arises when there are no fixed points. So, the difficult problem in topology became incredibly simple when looking at it through the world of algebra. Thank you for watching this video. I hope that this explanation was interesting for you and made sense. This is a hard topic to talk about to a general audience, but nevertheless the key message that I want you to take away is that difficult topological problems can often be easily solved by translating into algebraic language. Perhaps next time you are working on a difficult math problem, you can ask, what language can I translate my problem into that might give me new insights or make the problem significantly easier? In any case, thank you again for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you again in the next video.